Today we've moved to an economy that is a uh, government that is financed to a large extent by actually the tax receipts, which uh, shows that the government knew from the beginning that it was not sustainable to live on donor money. Uh, so we've seen this, and today I think that the tax base has been increasing with uh, you know all these small businesses, companies like Bank of Kigali, we are actually among the largest uh, taxpayers. We are proud of financing uh, the government because we see the results on the road. You travel or you, you visit Kigali, you'll find new roads being built, uh, new housing uh, units being built. Hello everybody, wherever you are watching this conversation that I'm about to have, let me first ask, what is your impression when I say the country Rwanda? If like me, you've heard that Rwanda today is the Singapore of Africa, or to be more uh, polite uh, uh, with the person I'm going to be speaking to, uh, the Switzerland of Africa. Let me tell you this, that when I came into this country, everything I've experienced uh, to says that that perception is true. And it's an amazing journey that this country has made uh, from where it was to what it is today. And very clearly to anyone who comes and visits Rwanda, you will see that this country is on the verge of a takeoff. And the person who is in the best situation of all to give me a perspective uh, or give us a perspective of this takeoff uh, is Diane Karusisi. And um, for three very important reasons, Diane is the chief executive of the largest bank in Rwanda, the Bank of Kigali. Uh, she was uh, the chief planner, uh, uh, the, the chief economist uh, at the presidential uh, palace uh, and uh, she herself is a Rwandan who's come back from a very privileged growing up outside of Rwanda to be part of this story. And so it's my great pleasure to be able to capture that story of Rwanda in the person of uh, Diane Karusisi. Diane, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, before we talk about banking, I want to ask you some questions that are playing in my mind because I'm unable to reconcile uh, what I see to be what Rwanda should be, a $10 billion economy, uh, $700, $800 per capita, uh, and what I see on the, street, on the streets in terms of the infrastructure that the country has built is first world infrastructure in many cases, in many places, in many ways, uh, and the integrity of the social system, uh, the fact that the streets are safe, the fact that the judiciary works, that the fact that corruption is low, and a lot of the money actually goes into the infrastructure being built. Um, this is an amazing story in the development uh, of its economy. At the same time, uh, it, I get the impression that um, or rather the data, the statistics tells me that it is still a cash crop, um, you know, cash crop uh, agricultural economy um, and, you know, wanting to build a service infrastructure and so on. So just give me a sense for a start of this conversation. Where is Rwanda in its evolution? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, Emmanuel, for uh, letting me share my journey and, and uh, sharing you know, my experience living in Rwanda uh, with your viewers. So yeah, Rwanda is, you know, when you look at statistics, as you say, Rwanda is a small economy, it's still a poor economy, uh, with 25% uh, uh, share in, in agriculture. So we still have a long way to go. But, but Rwanda, I think, has a, 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 a visionary uh, leadership, has a very competent uh, uh, governance. And I think I, I might say we have a first world governance uh, although I think it wouldn't even uh, uh, be right because we are able to achieve so much with so little uh, when uh, some countries in you know, the first world can achieve things, but they have so much, right? 
So I think we have a first world or a very competent, brilliant uh, uh, government. And that's why you see this disconnect between uh, you know, the safety you see here, the organization, predictability, cleanliness is something that most people uh, mention when they come to, to Kigali, they visit us for the first time. You're able to see all this, but at the same time, look at statistics and you only see, you see less than $1,000 uh, per capita GDP. So I believe we have a very strong government. We have and, and has put in place the right foundation, as you say, for the country and the economy to take off. And you know, I can, I'm, I'm very bullish uh, about Rwanda. I believe what you see today, I think you can multiply by three, four, five. In the next five years, I think we'll have probably a uh, three, four, five thousand uh, per capita GDP. In the time that you were the chief economist in the presidential um, uh, cabinet, um, what were the priorities that the government set for itself? So I, I think uh, we have a very uh, pro-people government. And again, this is why I say we have a very uh, first world, uh, uh, we have a f first world government, although again, it's not doing it justice. It's very pro-people and very visionary. So everything is done to make sure we can you know, transform from an agrarian economy to a service-led, knowledge-based economy. And this is happening uh, because the way the priorities are set, the way uh, all the activities and programs are coordinated, really show that things can happen in, in a very fast pace. Uh, so, of course, education is, is a key uh, because we have you know, 12, 13 million people. Uh, we have more than half below uh, 20 years of age. So education is absolutely critical because we believe um, uh, it's the best resource. Human beings are our best resource in Rwanda. Uh, we are not uh, you know, resource rich. We don't have oil. We don't have diamonds but we believe Rwandans are the best resource that we can have. And that's why we're putting a lot into education and health. <clears throat> you can even tell uh, the, the, the um, management of the COVID crisis, I think was also first world. You know, we have probably the, the highest uh, levels of vaccination in the world, akin to those in, in the West, in Europe and, and in, the, in, the, in America. Yet, you know, we are still a, a very uh, poor country. So I believe the, the uh, focus on people is, is critical. So apart from that, I think uh, that the government has put a lot of effort to um, improving ease of doing business, transparency. I think corruption is something that does not you know, exist uh, in Rwanda. Uh, and this is very important as the right foundations uh, for us to you know, uh, take off as an economy. The government has also been, build, be, uh, has been building uh, core infrastructure. You've seen you know, roads. Um, electricity, when you look at the rates of electrification in the country, when I moved back to Rwanda uh, in 2009, it was below 20%. And today we are talking about 70%, which is, you know, which happens, happened in, in a very short period of time. So basic infrastructure is also being set up, uh, road network, electricity, water, etc. And these are really the right foundations, you know, the right people, education, health, the right systems in government, uh, lack of uh, corruption, transparency, ease of doing business, also the right uh, infrastructure. I think these are really the foundations for us to uh, uh, continue the transformation of our economy. And this is for a government uh, whose receipts, the funding, mm -hmm. uh, are not taxation at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, so what is the what is the, the the liability side of the balance sheet look like for government? When you look at again, we've seen. Uh, an improvement over time. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, we're still big recipients of you know, donor money, grants, etc., from uh, uh, countries, from um, uh, uh, large multilaterals. Today, we've moved to uh, a, a, an economy that is a uh, government that is financed to a large extent by actually tax receipts, which uh, shows that the government knew from the beginning that it was not sustainable, sustainable to live on, on, on donor money. Uh, so we've seen this, I don't have the numbers, but I think you can find the numbers uh, anywhere online. Uh, and today, I think that the tax base has been increasing with uh, you know, all these small businesses, you know, companies like Bank of Kigali, we are actually among the largest uh, taxpayers. We are proud of financing uh, the government because we see the results on the road. You go to, you travel or you, you visit Kigali, you'll find new roads being built, uh, new, um, uh, housing uh, units being built. So it's, it's, you really see that uh, the tax <laughs> we are paying is translated. It's being used, it's uh, well, being translated. 
Um, what is your personal thinking on um, aid-driven economies? Uh, actually, I want to just capture that a little bit because uh, in Africa right now, uh, there are many voices um, you know, uh, talking about uh, what aid should be and, and how aid had um, you know, affected the growth of, or rather you know, disrupted rather than helped to the growth of Africa. So, you know, of course, aid is, is, is something that can be good. But in most countries in Africa, I think it has not been good. And what was the difference for, with, with Rwanda? I think we, we got aid with a lot of accountability, and accountability not only to the donor, but accountability to the people of Rwanda. Uh, because it was important for us to make sure we are able to report back and say we've received this much aid, but you know, this is what we've built for our people. And, and I think what our government has done well, again, I cannot speak for the government, uh, was to make sure all the aid money that would come would finance our priorities, uh, priorities of the people of Rwanda, not the priorities of uh, you know, some uh, external powers. And we've seen it. I think in the past 20 years, uh, all this money, we can see it, you know, in infrastructure being built, in the systems being built. And this is what makes uh, the development journey sustainable. Because over time, we're now uh, winning ourselves off aid and you know, getting our government financed by uh, domestic uh, revenues, and, and we believe uh, um, you know, uh, things are going to only get better in the future. You know, I've now met uh, a number of um, senior people in, in Rwanda, um, you know, the, the International Financial Center, the Rwanda International Financial Center, uh, Rwanda Economic Development Board, uh, all of which is very familiar to me because I come from Singapore, and Singapore in 1965 uh, was exactly that, you know, set up an economic development board, go out and, and, um, and, and, and lure investors to come in and provide the capital for growth and so on. And what also like Singapore in 1965, um, many of your senior, of the senior people in government, as well as in large corporations uh, like the Bank of Kigali, are young. Mm -hmm. um, and many are returnees uh, who, who could have had the choice of a good life somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know. So give me a sense of why you came back. Um, you were a university professor in Switzerland, and then um, you were in Credit Suisse in asset management. Um, that's an amazing career, you know. And so, what brought you back to uh, to Rwanda? I think I think it's the, the desire of, of doing things or contributing to a, something bigger than just your own career and you know your journey. I were you lured back, or did you just somehow yes? But mainly because as a Rwandan, I was always proud of you know saying um, I come from Rwanda because of the great things that were being said about my country. I was used also to come often for you know holidays to spend time with family and always amazed but you know the progress i would see every six months or every year so i felt uh, you know working in a you know you can work you can have a very good career but you just you always feel like you are a small like a drop in the ocean and not really having an impact uh, moving back allows you to feel that you are really contributing to something bigger and i don't speak for myself you know many of my colleagues here the people i've worked with uh, in the past have you know come back come back from uh, the us from europe from asia etc because we really believe in, in, in the story uh, and, and the journey that uh, we are on and we want to contribute now when you came back there was no promise of big jobs and and big responsibilities mm -hmm. right so you had to sort of make it work for you of course of course i mean you know you you, you come back of course with a, a passion and a, and the willingness to serve and to contribute and, but you have to work your way you know, up where we want to be. And, and eventually, I think, when you do the right thing, uh, you have the right values, probably you also are uh, able to have bigger responsibilities. And, and you know, I, I hope that uh, I won't uh, disappoint the people <laughs> who... Well, uh, from what I've seen, you've done a very good job at uh, Bank of Kigali. You know? Now, at which point uh, did, were you tapped uh, from being a statistician and an economist uh, to actually running a business. Uh, how did that opportunity come? So, so you know, I, I have, my background is in econometrics and statistics. So when I came back, it was very natural uh, for me to contribute uh, in an area where I had some <coughs> technical expertise. Now, I, I moved to that position because we had run uh, uh, large surveys and the census, you know, giving the country the right uh, evidence and data uh, for planning. 
So from that position, I, I, I moved to the office of the president where you know, I was supporting with the uh, designing of the policies, etc. And I think that the knowledge of the country I had acquired in running and you know, these surveys, etc., was, I think, very relevant then. Uh, but you know, I came from banking. Uh, although it's not commercial banking, it was uh, you know, asset management at the time. And I was always interested to understand how you know, the financial sector was developing here. So I was serving still on the board of uh, the second largest financial institution, actually. So I wanted to be acquainted to understand what's happening and to see if I can contribute to the knowledge, you know, with ideas, etc. And I kept a connection sort of with uh, the banking sector. And that's how you know, I was able to come back. Uh, what was Bank of Kigali when you first uh, started engaging with it? Uh, for a small economy, I mean, we thought, you know, even looking at the balance sheet, I would say that it will be five or six corporates make the biggest asset, you know, uh, base, um, you know, and retail, you know, doesn't even feature. Uh, and, you know, and, and the culture would be very entitled and very slow, um, you know, and every year the bank will give out loans to its, you know, five best clients and then you're done. Um, you know, and I mean, that's what I imagine uh, uh, a state-run commercial bank would be in any other country, right? What, what was the state-run commercial bank uh, that you inherited and what were the targets that you set for yourself? So I, I think it, it was probably a little better than, than that would you okay. envision. <laughs> uh, although, you know, the challenges were there, uh, a culture that is, you know, quite uh, not entitled, but uh, comfortable, you know, with doing business with some large corporates and you know, trying to do some business with uh, the, the SME and retail segments. And, and uh, I think what I brought was uh, to do things differently and to think digital, because I believe this is the only way for us to scale. I mean, uh, digitalization is giving us, Africa, an opportunity to leapfrog. And uh, when I came, I think my agenda, and you know, was supported by the board was, let's digitize. So we entered a huge uh, program of digital transformation, looking at core infrastructure, you know, core applications. Uh, we implemented new systems, etc. Because we believe uh, we want to be able to provide financial services to everyone, anywhere, but you know, on a mobile phone. And, and this, I think, will help us reach millions of Rwandans uh, that uh, we cannot serve if they, have, they all have to come to our branches. So that has been the journey. It's not easy. It's, it's very difficult. And, and uh, digitization is, is beyond just you know, implementing new uh, products or new applications. It's also very cultural, uh, having teams that are agile, working together, stopping the silo mentality. I think this is a big part of what I've learned uh, in my journey at Bank of Kigali. You know, Bank of Kigali has probably about 400,000 retail customers, yes, right? And, uh, and the country's population is... Uh, 13 million around there. Um, that's that's a huge um, gap in, in terms of um, you know bringing more people into the financial sector um, and uh, onboarding you know the bottom of the pyramid, the unbanked, and so on. Um, and as you do that, the balance sheet of the bank starts to change. Uh, and as the balance sheet of the bank starts to change, the, the funding base of the country starts to change because um, it's, if you're able to um, mobilize the, 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 fi the, the financial resources uh, or at the intermediation level, um, the country becomes more self-sufficient and stuff like that. Where is Rwanda in that journey and where is Bank of Kigali in that journey? Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with you uh, 100%. I think we need to be able, for, for us to do effective intermediation, we need to have millions of customers. Because today, uh, and I think that that's something that differentiates us from uh, countries in um, uh, uh, East Asia, when they were you know, in the same development uh, trajectory, is our savings rate. We don't have enough long-term savings. And for us to do effective intermediation, we need to have a pool of savings. That is, one, long-term, as much as possible, Second, diversified as much as possible, so we're able to allocate it to investment, and we can invest in long-term projects, uh, you know, in many sectors of the economy uh, for us really uh, to create wealth, jobs, etc. Uh, so, so that's why it's, it's critically important for us to be able to reach pretty much every single runner, uh, not only offering transactional banking services, but offering you know savings product, 
offering insurance uh, products, life insurance, because these are all long-term uh, savings products that will help us finance uh, the asset base uh, uh, of our balance sheet, and as much as possible, long-term facilities in local currency uh, for, for SMEs and our corporates. Today, we still rely a lot on, on DFI funding. You know, these, these are development financial institutions from the region because we need to you know, fill that gap in our funding uh, because we need long-term funding for us to uh, finance the economy. And I believe as we, um, we grow our balance sheet, as we become a bit more sophisticated and offering uh, targeted products for all segments of our clients, we will be able to have a you know, diversified uh, funding source long term as much as possible that will help us uh, you know, further uh, support the economy. As CEO, how much of your uh, mental um, I mean like bandwidth uh, is spent on assets uh, of your you know, top clients and how much of that is spent on this um, you know, diversifying and, and building the intermediation base because that's nuts and bolts stuff. That's uh, street level stuff. That's transaction problems, uh, throughput and this and that. Um, you know, it, it sort of changes you uh, from an economist to a, a banker in a traditional sense and then um, a transaction banker. Um, just describe to me what you've been learning uh, in that process. So I, of course, I, I am a very hands-on uh, person. So as much as I want to spend uh, some time on strategy, uh, because uh, when I joined, we started to uh, uh, diversify into new uh, uh, products, insurance, we started insurance, we started investment banking, fund, fund management, etc. As much as it's important for me to think, uh, to think strategy, I also very much like every day is a problem, you know. There's <laughs> always, of course, it's uh, you know we are firefighting every day, but I always would like to go and meet the clients. So we, we have uh, regular you know sessions where we go up country, we meet with business people, the, we call them opinion leaders in in, in these you know uh, regions, just to understand you know what they're up to, uh, what their ambitions are, and we keep telling them that. Uh, we want you to tell us what you want and we'll help you achieve, you know, whatever you want to invest And what in. are they saying? Because um, a lot of them would be, in another country, they would be considered small businesses, mm -hmm. um, you know, and yet they might be middle market for you by now mm -hmm. and maturing. What are your clients telling you? So, of course, you know, they're also very transactional. Sometimes when you meet them, they'll tell you... The problems you know, are transactional. Yes, yeah. they have very, like, basic problems. They want longer term funding. Uh, they want us to reduce our collateral coverage because sometimes you know we want <clears throat> significant collateral to cover our risk. Uh, you know they want us basically to to lo to increase our risk appetite. I think this is very transactional. But what we also tell them is that we see them coming together uh, because sometimes it's even very the, the transaction costs of us you know dealing with the very small uh, businesses are high. Sometimes we tell them come together have a big project that you know, we will be and will really transform uh, your city or your village. And we see that you know, uh, coming along, we have a lot of business people that are coming together to set up big uh, projects in um, logistics, in uh, real estate, etc. And this, you know, when you go to a city, you actually see change and this is actually very you know, fulfilling. What are, the, what are the milestones that have, you've given yourself? Uh, you know, uh, what would you feel um, will make it look like, or feel, make you feel like, like you've achieved something? Uh, you know, short-term milestones and maybe a, a, you know, a long-term milestone in the institution. So, so my, my short-term uh, milestones are, first of all, to reach more people. I have a, a hard number. I want to reach a million clients, retail clients. I think that's something that is very achievable in the next year or two. Uh, with you know the, the work we're doing, my other milestone, and this is actually one KPI that I get from the board, is to diversify my my source of income, sources of income. Today, um, I still rely on uh, interest income. Eighty percent of, of my income is still interest income, so I want this number to reduce to sixty percent, so I can get you know enjoy more commission income, uh, premiums coming from uh, our insurance business, etc. And we have um, our um, vision is to become. Uh, a one-stop center for all financial services in the city, in, in the country. And we want to be able to offer all our products on the phone. So we want a business to say, I want, I apply for loan, I can apply for uh, you know, insurance policy for you know, my car, my assets, etc. 
all that this on the phone, and we believe this is uh, things that we can achieve. Is there a desire to dominate the financial sector, as in uh, do as much as possible in house? Uh, rather than with partners in insurance, for example, you know, uh, uh, do you see yourself being a supermarket of insurance products, leaving it to other players to build the insurance industry, or you know, does Bank of Kigali want to become a, a group structure where you know you you become dominant and and hold? I, I'm asking this question because. Uh, you are right at that phase in the evolution of your financial structure of the entire country um, to, uh, you know, to dominate. Um, you know, and, and yet, after you dominate, you realize that your cost structures start to get on you and you, you rather buy products and to uh, you know, build them yourself and stuff like that. Just give me a sense of how you're thinking about this. So, so I, I believe we already have somehow a dominant position and, and we already set up a group structure. Uh, the group is the one actually that is listed on, on the stock market and uh, is an investor. It's a holding company that invests in subsidiaries. As we speak now, we have four subsidiaries. Uh, this year, we want to set up a life insurance uh, business b because we believe uh, being a um, locally sort of owned uh, company is, is a competitive advantage to us. Uh, when you look around, uh, most banks are uh, regional in nature, uh, with headquarters either in Morocco or in Kenya, or EcoBank is uh, headquartered, I think, in Nigeria. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so I really believe decision making uh, is so far away from our context. Okay. And we have the advantage of you know, taking the decision Being here. here and understanding the context of, of this country much better than any of, of our competitors. So that's why many of our products actually built here in house. The app that you know we are transacting on is built by our people, because we want it to be uh, evolving with the needs of our clients, not just buy products, uh, you know, and implement a product that you know will just constrain your growth. Um, and uh, I think I think what we want is to become again a household name, which we we are already in some sense. But uh, the go-to places for anyone uh, who wants uh, to have the best financial services. And as a CEO, uh, which institutions outside of um, you know of Rwanda that you look at um, you know for uh, as uh, inspiration, uh, as something that you would like to become, or maybe they have they're doing something that's right that you'd like to learn from. I mean, I'm sure there's several. Uh, you know. Yeah. So, so today, uh, uh, to be honest, most. You know, corporate leaders like me would look at uh, these digital giants. Uh, just you know, it's impressive when you look at the growth. Uh, when, when you look at you know the, the it's a non-risk income. You know, commission right. income. It's amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, the likes of you know Google or Netflix or all these uh, digital giants that will just uh, exploit the data they have to sell more, etc. This is very inspiring. And I believe that uh, we, as a financial services company, we are becoming also, to a large extent, a technology company that happens to do banking, to do insurance, etc. And, and that's why I want us, to, uh, we are investing heavily in technology because we believe that uh, it's the only way for us to scale and to be closer to our clients. Because again, we are a very young population, you know, 50% of our people less than 20. Okay. So all these people are very digital savvy and uh, they won't come to a branch, they won't things real time immediately and you know with the you know the right experience the answers that you've given me so far are very corporate answers because your responsibility is to uh, the institution bank of kigali but i've seen so much talent out there um, a lot of young people um, and the innovations that they're bringing in place may well make finance look very different from what it is today uh, at the same time at a personal level you're an inspiration yourself uh, you know, uh, being young and having held this responsibility and and uh, and uh, and and the uh, inspiration that you can provide um, to young people, to women out there. Um, what do you have to say um, to the talent pool that exists outside in in on the streets in in Kigali in in Rwanda, um, and uh, and how do you connect what you're doing with the bank uh, with what needs to be done on the streets? Well, it, it's a loaded question. Loaded. <laughs> it, it is. It is. I think, I hope you, you agree with that. I... So, so we have a number of, of programs that we implement uh, within the bank as part of CSR to support young entrepreneurs, uh, to support women uh, in business, etc. Uh, but I think just, you know, 
uh, being a woman leader, uh, leading the largest uh, financial services institution in the country, itself says something. You know, I think it tells young uh, girls, boys, people of Rwanda that everything is possible. So I think I, I, I see it as a responsibility. I really have to do it well because you know, there are people who are looking up to me. Uh, and I, I, I really believe that uh, we have a historic opportunity uh, as Rwandans because of everything that is happening here. Mm. Uh, a lot of great things are happening here from, uh, it's not even a low base, from nowhere, from nothing, showing that it's possible actually to transform uh, Africa you know, into a, a better place for Africans. And, and I believe that we have to seize this opportunity uh, as young people. So we, most young people have a passion. Uh, they, you know, they pursue some activities, they have, they, you know, create small businesses. They, you know, work in, in enterprises, etc. So, you know, I, I just want to tell them you have to keep at it, you know, do your best, uh, because they're beyond just Rwanda. There are many people on the on the continent looking at us and saying, if these people manage to grow and, and to transform and to develop, uh, maybe you know it's possible and, and everyone can do it. So I, I'm I'm hoping that we are in a place where. We'll uh, take advantage of all the opportunities we have uh, to inspire other people. And you are already, as a country and as a people, an inspiration uh, to the rest of Africa and definitely an inspiration uh, on a global stage. Uh, and I really wish you well. And I hope that this, this conversation is something that we can continue into the future. And, and, uh, and that you know, we'll, we'll have reason to celebrate uh, what Rwanda has become today. And it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, having this conversation with you.